So, good morning everyone. Welcome to this second lecture of data, our data-driven science, artificial intelligence in material science. Um, I think it's start to get ready, so I share my screen with you. So, my name is Claudia Draxel. I'm a professor at the Humboldt University, for those who don't know me, and at the same time also Max Planck Fellow at the Max Planck Graduate Center for Quantum Materials with an affiliation at the Fritz Haber um, Institute. And what I would like to discuss with you today is um, the NOMAD uh, project, NOMAD repository, archive, and the encyclopedia. And let me get started uh, right away. What does it mean? So remember from the last lecture that we discussed, so Matthias Scheffler discussed how important it is to have a fair data infrastructure that can host all materials data in order to make progress with artificial intelligence. So definitely you need data for employing artificial intelligence methods also for develop them. Crucially important is the point that I really want to um, point out more clearly during the lecture is the interoperability of data because if you bring data together from different sources, you need to make sure that they really can talk to each other. So what do I like to address today? Um, I'll introduce the NOMAD infrastructure to you. So NOMAD is a living example for such uh, materials data infrastructure. Um, and I want to particularly point out that such infrastructure is not a pure technical thing where you upload and download data, but I really would like to discuss how it can contribute to science and how it, uh, yeah, it asks scientific questions by itself. So such a data infrastructure is by far more than just a database. Um, and yeah, this brings me to my outline. What I like to, um, to talk about today is, in short, I'll introduce the NOMAD laboratory. Um, I will discuss the FAIR principles. Um, uh, in that context, I will also talk about the scientific data that we are producing and, and their quality. Uh, and as I said already, I would like to in particular emphasize that such an infrastructure is part of our science, something you can do science with. And uh, so I like to raise a few scientific questions and at the end I'll give an outlook where we are going. And for all these different topics, um, these are smaller portions after each topic, I'll allow for some questions that you might have. And I also have some questions to you in between. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I introduced NOMAD in a nutshell because I'm coming back to it uh, all the time. I just tell you at the beginning what NOMAD is about. So the Novel Materials Discovery uh, Repository is a data repository that was established already in 2014 and as you can see uh, from, uh, from this sketch here, that we allow people from all over the world to upload their data. These are computational material science data, so all the input and output files can be uploaded into a central database. And this is the NOMAD uh, repository. So uh, we have a web page. You can uh, visit it at the nomadlab.eu. And there you can already find out the different components of the NOMAD lab. Uh, this is the repository and the archive. Uh, I'll discuss what the differences in, in, in a few moments or a bit later. To... So, but yeah, this is the start, was the starting point, the repository, the collection of the data. Then we established what we call the materials encyclopedia. Um, the artificial intelligence toolkit uh, was discussed to some extent already by Matthias Schäffler last time, but it will be ba the basis uh, of the of most of the uh, of the uh, exercises. We will discuss and the tools there will be discussed in much more detail, in particular by uh, lectures by Lukas Gerengeli, but also many others. Then we have a component of uh, NOMAD, this is the European Center of Excellence. 
Um, it has to do with data, but it also has a strong uh, focus on exascale computing. Uh, so what I would like to discuss today is basically two of these components. It's the repository and the materials encyclopedia, right? And as I said, I'd like to emphasize the physics, the science behind it. So there's also a few movies if you like to get an introduction into the Nomad um, Laboratory. So there's a movie, again, with the title Laboratory in a Nutshell. Uh, there's another one, uh, it's called the Nomad COE, but uh, the, the, the name has simply to do with the fact that also the, the most of the tools, or at least several of the tools uh, developed uh, for the Nomad Laboratory were developed in a um, European Center of Excellence that was running between 2015 and 2019. But in essence, it's very similar uh, to, um, to the first one. It captures the, um, the, the, the infrastructure and the, the tools that you can, can use. Yeah, there are several other movies. If you look at the web page, I don't go into detail here because some of them are also used in the exercises, as you will see, for instance, later in the afternoon. Then let me come to the uh, topic already. This is fairness. Um, I also like to just show you in a nutshell what fairness is about. It goes back, or the, the terminology goes back to a paper by Wilkinson and many courses that was published in 2016 in Scientific Data. Um, it's about guiding principles, FAIR guiding principles. And just in short, FAIR uh, stands for findable, that's the F, accessible, that's the A, interoperable, that's the I, and reusable, this, this is uh, VR. So every database, open science project uh, in terms of data should fulfill this FAIR guiding principles. So, I'm just going into detail, talking into detail here about uh, all this. I just get back to the Nomad Laboratory and we'll discuss with the example of the laboratory, uh, where the Nomad Laboratory is there and what this, um, these two different uh, figures of there mean. Right? So then let's get started with. Uh, uh, so as you have seen already some picture what the repository is about, how to use the repository. This will be um, uh, introduced by Markus Scheidken in the afternoon by the exercises. So I'm not going to talk about it. Um, but I will ask the question why we need a repository. And uh, in this context, I would like to introduce to you the um, research, how we are doing research today and how we may do research uh, tomorrow or in a few years, I would say. Right? So in this context, I also like to discuss material science data. Um, and so there are data types, the sizes, the methods, and then such that we get an idea how such a database uh, is filled, what these data are inside such a database. And I give you a heads up uh, because the Nomad repository so far is to 99.99 whatever percent uh, purely consisting of theoretical data, of calculated data. So, but we are in the process of extending to experiment and I would like to give you uh, some idea how complex um, FAIR data in experiment will be, uh, but in essence, I think having one repository, one such FIA data infrastructure in place, it's quite natural to extend it also to experimental data. So um, let me get to the, um, to the first point here in connection with, with, with the data um, and just discuss how we are doing physics today. Uh, you all are doing uh, physics. In, in a lab. So as I said, I'm a theoretical physicist. Um, I'm at, at the beginning at least uh, talking about theoretical data. So what, how do we work in, in theory? So in, in essence, uh, we are all sitting on our computers. Some of us um, develop methods, others derive equations, others implement these equations into computer programs. But 
at the end of the day, I think any of us, they run some calculations and for solving interesting scientific problems, um, they need a lot of computing power. And needing a lot of computing power also means somehow that they produce um, quite, quite a lot of scientific data. Now, what do we do with all the knowledge that we gain? Um, as most of you may have experienced already, the nice thing is that once you have finished a project or once you have finished a master's thesis or a PhD thesis, you're happy to publish papers. So we like our papers. However, um, we may ask the question whether we can do more rather than publishing papers. And um, in order to discuss this, I would like to uh, zoom into one of them and just discuss with you what we find in such a paper. Right? So this is a paper about uh, thermoelectric materials. So I'm not going to talk about the content of the paper. Uh, it's not what the lecture is about. However, I want to tell you or discuss with you what we find in such a paper. Right? So obviously, we find tables. Don't read it. It's just an example that we have tables in the paper. We find figures. Yes, we have a few figures in this paper. We find a structural um, um, representation of the material that we investigated. We may find a few other numbers that we have extracted. But in essence, what we publish is, of course, only the best of. So the most important things, and this is good because nobody could read uh, all uh, the, the information that we have gained during running our research and, uh, and producing our, our data. So in essence, we never provide in the paper all the information. Of course, if you think uh, about your own papers, you may have used a year or maybe even two of very hard work of a lot of insight gained thereby before such a paper can be published. And in many papers, there's not only one also, there may be several people contributing to this. So how could you cast all this in a publication rather than just uh, picking out the highlights? But you have gained a lot of insight during doing this research, and that's why it would be really useful to provide this insight and this information also to forthcoming generations of students, of researchers. So we have to admit that our daily research is really great, publication papers is really great, but overall it might be a slow process if you think about the problems that we like to solve in, yeah, for future technologies in energy, transportation and things like that. So how can we provide uh, the information? Yeah, we have to exploit basically all the data that we have created because most of the data, they simply got forgotten on a, on a hard disk somewhere, many cases, or at, at some point, in all cases, they're thrown away. And this is definitely not very efficient because the next student may run the same calculations again, do the same experiments again, if you also talk about experiment. So providing more information to future generations is definitely um, an, an important point. So let's have a look into the data that we generate. So I discussed this with the thermoelectric figure of merit. So I, I said before, this example that I have shown you uh, was from, from a paper about thermoelectricity. And I need to tell you that the NOMAD repository was established uh, as a bilateral project between Matthias Scheffler and me uh, in the framework of a project on thermoelectricity. So we collected uh, basically the information about the data that we, we, we create here. So the thermoelectric figure of merit is simply the number, it's one number that tells you um, the quality of a material, if you like to um, use it for thermoelectric devices. So it's basically the ratio between the electric and the thermal conductivity. And let's have a look now what you need to compute in order to get this single number out. Right? So 
We start with, um, with the input. Um, I, I should emphasize here that everything needs to be computed for a, a, a pretty large temperature range. So it's not a single calculation that we perform for, for zero Kelvin. We have to do everything for a large temperature range because uh, thermoelectric devices should be used uh, in all kinds of different machines and uh, at, at all kinds of, of temperatures, depending on the, the temperature and the, the heat these machines create. Mm -hmm. So we start with the input. This is very small, so it's just atomic position, so the nuclear charges. Uh, you may add properties of free at atoms and, and, and some symmetry. At the end, you can compute most of these things again. But this is to get started, and this is very small, a few numbers. Of a, I would say in the in the order of of, um, of kilobyte. Right? So then um, we compute the geometry, um, also as a function of temperature. And for geometry, uh, uh, we want to compute also the phonon spectra. The phonon spectra give rise to the thermal conductivity. Uh, this is one of the ingredients to the figure of merit. And for the electrical conductivity we again uh, need to employ various methods. So if you look now at the right side here for the geometry, you would use density functional theory. For the electric conductivity, we would use many body perturbation theory uh, or uh, for, the, for the phonon spectra and thermal conductivity, we would use either density functional perturbation theory or even better, um, ab initio uh, molecular dynamics. So if you now collect all this and you see at the right column how much data we create by this. So VFD is not too demanding, but if you use molecular dynamics, this can uh, give you data in the range of terabytes. The same for excited states. They are quite involved methods, so they involve um, uh, operators, two particle operators, and uh, so matrix elements of these operators would also give you very quickly um, uh, terabyte, gigabyte to terabyte um, amounts. And the same is true for ab initio molecular dynamics if you really want to store different snapshots different uh, on, on a trajectory. So, but at the end of the day, what we publish would, for instance, be the figure of merit, which is basically one number, right? And then you see what you have created, all these terabytes of data to be thrown away. This is very, very unfortunate. It's a waste of computer capacity, but it's also a waste of human power if the next generation of, of students um, does, um, does the same, right? So um, we have to do better. And this was, as I said, the starting point for the NOMAD um, laboratory. And um, well, interestingly, uh, we put it uh, open already in 2014. So pretty shortly after we, we established it because we found it quite useful uh, for ourselves. And we thought it might be useful also for, for other people. Right? And this 2014, by the way, was two years before the data principles uh, were created. But I like to emphasize now that even in 2014, we had already put together a, a fair data infrastructure. So obviously, data can be uploaded, and data uploaded are definitely findable. So we um, allow people to find this data, and that means we can tick off the F in the in the fair. So shortly about the uh, about the archive, uh, what's the difference between the um, repository and the archive? So the data that we create, that you may create, um, are raw data. And this is the same, uh, doesn't make a big difference between theory and experiment. There's always raw data and there's process data, right? So the archive deals with process data. And the importance for processing data is lies in the interoperability. So I have in the fair, I have skipped for the moment, I come back in a second to this, the A, the accessibility, and the jump to the interoperability here. Because you could imagine that many people on this planet uploading data to the repository 
They don't use the same methods. They don't use the same computer codes. They don't use um, the same parameters. So there is a variety of different data up in the cloud now. And we find quite proud that we have collected in the meantime more of 100 million calculations. So there is no way that this has been produced by one person or by, by one code. And we have to deal with this and we're happy to deal with this because NOMAD is definitely a community effort uh, where everyone is welcome to contribute. And you see from this graph here on the right side, um, this is a, a, a statistic from some point in, um, in time. You see how many of these computer codes are used in the community. In essence, it's, it's about 40. So these are the ones with the, uh, with the uh, largest amounts of data uploaded to the repository. So these are 40 different uh, computer codes. And what the archive does, or what, what you find then in the archive is not the raw data, this you find in the repository, but it's, it's normalized data. And normalized means that the community uh, not only uses different me methods and different codes, but they also use different units. So in, in, in physics, it may be Rydberg or electron volt. In chemistry, it would be more kilocalories per, per, per mole and, and things like that. But we don't want to use of a repository to bother about this. And that's why it's crucially important that we bring everything to the same uh, units. We use uh, international units, but of course it can be the back transformed, so we can also provide it uh, in, in, in other units. And it's also crucially important to find all this data in the same data format. So how can we do? Because every code developer writes the code in an individual manner. And I think this is fair enough. This is very good. But again, we don't want the user to bother about uh, which of or how does an output file look of this or the other code. If user wants to use the data, we should bring them together in a unified for file format. And for doing so, well, um, we can tick off interoperability because this normalized data, so to say, guarantees us that we can bring together data from different sources. However, in order to do so, this was a hell lot of work because you need to understand what every number in every output file means here. So we need to understand um, the difference between the output of CP2K and quantum espresso or whatever. And that means that we need to define, describe this data, or in other words, we need to define metadata for every single item in the code. So there are general ones, of course, the total energy is a generic expression for all the codes, but what the total energy in VASP or being or exciting is maybe a different issue. And that's why we need to describe them very properly. So it was crucially important to put up this unique description of the data such that we can fully parse every input and output file. So again, we had to write 40 parsers for these 40 different codes. And I'm not going to in, into detail here because uh, the archive will also be a matter of, um, of the exercises for in, yeah, uh, partly today, but also, also later because you will see how you can use it in order to make uh, use of artificial um, intelligence here. So this brings me to um, the alien fair, and this is the um, accessibility. Right? So, I mean, of course, if you can upload data, you can download. Of course, we allow for downloading data, and in this sense, of course, data are definitely accessible by any, any machine or a script that you, uh, that you run. Uh, but if you have a closer look, then you see that naturally we find all this data sitting there in files. Yeah. That's okay. So we find the input and the output files. This is very, very handy um, um, because you can immediately see what people have done. But now I have a first question to you and particularly um, to the uh, experimentalists. So also we can claim data are accessible, they, are def they definitely are. I would like to ask you if you would be happy 
with a database that just gives you numbers and input and output files. What do you think about it? How many experimentalists do we have here, by the way? Could you raise your hand? I guess it must be quite a few. No experimentalists, so you all must be happy with input and output files where you find numbers. Okay, great. So then let me uh, let me tell you, this is very useful, but only useful for experts. So if you want to run a code again and see if you get the same results, of course, you can use the input files that you find there and you run it again. Um, if you want to compare explicitly numbers from different codes, you can also use the input files. But this is really useful for someone who wants to know uh, what the results of these calculations are. I doubt. And this is why I think accessibility alone in terms of uh, machine readability is not good enough for us. And that's why we've come up with the concept of the Nomad Encyclopedia. And this is what I'm going to talk about in a second. But before this, I would like to give you the opportunity to, task, to ask questions about what we have heard so far. So do we have questions about FAIR uh, principles in general? Or in particular, do we have questions about the NOMAD repository? OK, so we have either everyone being asleep or everyone being happy, I hope, for the second. So let's continue with the second, uh, with the second um, uh, topic. This is the NOMAD encyclopedia. What does it mean? Uh, we really wanted to make data human accessible and show in a graphical uh, user interface what the results of calculations are. So how it works, how you can use it, uh, you will again hear in uh, later this semester, so in a few weeks from now, in the second exercise block by Laura Niemannan. So I don't uh, introduce you to the, uh, to the function, but more to the science part of it. So first of all, the thoughts behind, um, then also how it can support science, what are the tools that we uh, can implement for supporting science. And I start right away with the challenges. So what we have seen so far, what we have in the repository is 100 million of data is then from 40 different codes. And this is results, computed results. So um, now we have 40 different codes. Uh, here is uh, a list of them, not a full list. Um, maybe the most important ones. Then each of these codes employs a base set for solving, for instance, the Conchem equation of TFT, but also for other equations that we may, may solve. So um, will be approximately 10. Could be plane waves, could be local functions, could be a combination of these, could be Gaussians, could be uh, whatever. Then the database hosts many different methods. So it's not only density functional theory, but it's also ab initio molecular dynamics. It's classical molecular dynamics. We have wave function based methods as used in quantum chemistry. We have many body perturbation theory in order to describe excited states. And there's more to come. I mean, such a database and such a data infrastructure, of course, cannot be get stuck at some point, but need to be developed further. So let's summarize. We have about 10 different variants. Then we have materials. We heard from Matthias Schäffler last week that the space of materials is practically infinite. So um, you can, if particularly a computer, you can create whatever you want, maybe as crazy as can be, but you can run a calculation for crazy materials. So you can create any, any kind of structure. So infinite number. We can categorize them so into systems. So uh, you may distinguish between direct surfaces, 2D, 1D molecules, um, uh, whatever you name it. Let's uh, assume this is again 10 different um, types of systems. Then we have properties, structural, electronic, vibrational. So people may be only interested in one of them, thermal, elastic, spectroscopic, whatever. 
Again, we have, let's say, 10 of them. And last but not least, you can also categorize this, um, this data into functions. So some of you may be interested in superconductors, other in thermal electricity and solar absorbers. Again, let's make it 10 out of, of here. And then you need to, um, to, to consider that nearly all kinds of combinations are possible. So how can you approach this problem making a graphic user interface that is really uh, useful for, for people. And here is the users coming in because they are also very diverse. So maybe most of them at the moment come from academia, but we also have industrial users who may like to see how relevant um, a material would be for a different function or for, for a different device. But we also would, uh, we would like to serve the, the, the general public, the interest the general public, like uh, as school kids who want to write a, um, a report on, on, on something and get some information there. So this is really a complicated task. And uh, so we took a, a decision and say, look, in the uh, repository, we have the, the, all the focus is on calculations. So you can upload a calculation, you can download a calculation or more, you can combine them into data sets. But a, a graphic user interface may not be useful for just allowing you to find calculation. And we wanted to put the focus on the materials. So the encyclopedia should give you a materials oriented view on the data that we have. So in other words, you may search for materials, either on the depending on the composition or formula or depending on the properties. You will give, uh, obtain a list of materials that fulfill these properties. You will get an overview of calculations that are available in the uh, database. And then you may see structural properties, methodology, electronic structure, and so forth. Also, so forth. There's more and, of course, more to come. So, and this is just a snapshot how it looks. Uh, you may choose, as I said, either um, by uh, choosing uh, elements that are involved in, in the material, but also materials name or formula. You may also choose properties um, that you're interested in. Uh, and then you start your search. You can also choose, uh, let's say, crystal types and things like that. You start your search and then you get a list of materials. And once you choose one of these materials, for instance, uh, this one here, then you see all the information about the structure, about the electronic structure, about the methodology, um, about um, calculations available, and vibrational and thermal properties. And if I go back here, you can, by clicking on this plus button, also get more information than what is displayed here. So, whatever has been computed all over the world, we aim at showing it to interested users. And, um, yeah, um, questions to this, if you have? No. So, then we continue with the encyclopedia and now after describing somehow the technical part very briefly, I like to discuss its scientific impact. And I think a very pressing scientific question is to understand when and how materials are similar. So can we find materials that are similar either in terms of the structure, in terms of the properties, in terms of the function? I mean, an encyclopedia should give you all this information somehow, right? So given I'm interested in superconductivity, could you find me materials that are also used for superconductors? But yeah, one question is how do these similarities correlate? So can I deduce information or from a structure on the properties or on the function. So it's the correlation between various properties. But the question is, of course, uh, we have to define first what we mean with similarity. And this is a very hot topic in, in, in research 
it itself to define similarities and to give it so to say uh, also a meaning what you what you or what you mean with this so there was um uh, a, a puzzle an old standing it's still an old standing puzzle somehow um how you when do you call material similar and i give you an example of um, of, of the structure I think in the in the Max Planck Graduate Center, there's quite a few people uh, working on superconductors, and superconductivity was a uh, was a research topic of myself, but many years ago, uh, in the times of high temperature superconductors, which, by the way, I've still not fully underst uh, understood, but I just like to address this uh, this topic here in terms of similarity. So what you see here, all these structures, these are all high temperature superconductors. And in black on top, I've provided the, um, the critical temperature. In some cases, also provided the pressure you need in order to reach this. Right? So you have different families, the lanthanum family, the yttrium, the thallium, and the mercury families. So, but let's zoom into one, and I've chosen here the, the example of the yttrium family, this yttrium barium copper oxide. Before this, um, I like to point out what these materials have in common. So obviously, they all have these copper oxygen planes. Right? So without such copper oxygen plane, you wouldn't find high temperature superconductivity, at least in this time and in this class. They're definitely not in this class. So obviously, this structural feature is responsible for the function and for the properties. So, but then let's zoom into one. Yttrium barium copper oxide um, can, um, can vary, or these, these materials can vary in the oxygen concentration, right? So, but still, as you see here from comparing two different structures, um, this is O6 on the left side and O7 on the right hand side. Uh, there is um, the structure is basically the same, right? So, in essence, we find a copper oxygen plane in them. We find the second copper oxygen plane. We find the plane of barium atoms separating them. We find a plane of barium atoms on top, and the second plane of barium atoms underneath the other layer, and we find a layer of copper atoms, which is nearly the same in this material. So, but this material besides having copper also has some oxygen. And this is what the concentration X is here. And what we show here, and this is a graph, an old graph by, uh, oops, sorry, uh, by uh, Bob Kava. It shows you that if you look at the left structure, you end up with a, not a superconductor at all, it's an anti-Fermi magnetic insulator, but if you go to x equal one and a bit lower, you find a high temperature superconductor. So you would argue the structure is the same to 99 point whatever percent, but the result is something completely different. If you are interested in superconducting properties, so it might be a completely different story if you're interested in elastic properties there, they might be very, very similar, right? So the question is always what you want to know. And to get started, um, Martin Kuban um, implemented um, a similarity measure uh, for the density of states. And this goes back to a paper by uh, Oleg Isaev in the group of Quetorolo um, um, that was published in 2015. So, they, I mean, they don't define, but they use the similarity coefficient that is known TC, that is known as the Tanamoto coefficient. And uh, note here, we just talked about superconductivity, that C is the critical temperature and C is an, a, a subscript. Here it's the, the similarity coefficient TC and T is not a subscript. So it's something different. It's a number between zero and one. So one means the materials are very, very similar or probably the same. And zero means these materials don't have anything in common. And we apply this to the density of states. So, and these results that I'm going to show you are based on um, 
using the Encyclopedia MPI, uh, API. So Martin has downloaded 280,000 materials, probably in the meanwhile he's using more, um, and he's using this for his scientific analysis. So I show you a very simple example, it's Gallio Martinite. And so Martin asked the question, what are the materials among these 280,000 that are most similar to gallium arsenide in the density of states. So next comes gallium phosphide with a, a similarity coefficients of 0.83. Um, well, everyone dealing with, um, with uh, semiconductors would tell you, so what, that's no surprise, we know what it is, right? Let's look at the next um, closest in, in the coefficients is NAD, SI. I don't know if you would have guessed that this could be very similar in the electronic structure. And I said this is just a simple um, example. And what we have in mind is, of course, to, uh, to serve different purposes. So just to give you an, an example for the future, um, we all know that um, modern solar cells or the, the most high material for solar cells are hybrid perovskites. Yeah. These hybrid perovskites, they have uh, in very, very nice uh, efficiencies in the solar cells, but they have a drawback. They have contain a lot of, of uh, lead. Right? So how to get rid, if you want to have an environmentally friendly technology, how to get rid of an environmentally not so friendly element. So how to get rid of, uh, uh, of, of, of lead? If there is enough materials in the database, we could simply search for materials that have the same properties like perovskite, halide perovskite, but are lead free. Maybe something completely different, maybe similar materials without lead, but maybe something completely different, sharing the electronic structure, sharing some other features, that might be or they uh, are relevant for, uh, for solar cells. So this is the way research should develop uh, when having such, uh, such tools, uh, tools in hand. Also, I'd like to, um, I'd like to emphasize the example of high throughput screening that uh, Matthias showed today. So this is just a summary. If you search with a high throughput screening initiative, for material that fulfills certain criteria, you may find just a few, so I've taken out three here, whereas thousand others, they end up in the dumpster because they're not useful for this property, right? Because so we said we have to recycle the waste and repurpose things, but you may well get rid of some of these screening initiatives if there's enough data collected where you can use, for instance, such similarity measures or tools in order to find materials that are used for a certain purpose. So you might find these three materials without probing either many, many others. So, and this brings me to a summary of the Nomad Encyclopedia. Um, I think I have convinced you, or I hope I have convinced you that uh, it makes data human accessible at the same time, the repository and then also the Nomad Encyclopedia, because the same data go there, uh, host uh, high throughput screening data by themselves, but maybe also an alternative to high throughput uh, screening data. Uh, it makes data reusable because here yeah, you can have a look at the data, how uh, uh, how they look, how they compare to others. So you can do more with this data, also with the similarity measures, you can do this. Um, um, and this is somehow a common feature with the uh, AI toolkit, but looking at different, uh, at different aspects from this. And so I think with this, we can already tick off a few more uh, and more things that are relevant for fair data infrastructures. However, and this will bring me to the next point. You always have to ask the question about the quality of the data in there. And so I will spend the next 
half hour or so, or less than half hour, with two aspects of data quality before I come to the outlook and future. But um, like before, at least you should have the opportunity to ask questions to whatever we have heard so far. Please. So, um, as I said, I would like to discuss the, the, the topic of the quality of our data, because obviously not all the data that we find there, they have the same accuracy or precision. So question to you uh, first, how would you distinguish between accuracy and precision? Is it the same? No? Okay. So let me define it. Um, we, because we need to have a clear picture, clear understanding, um, how we distinguish them. So what we understand with precision is everything that is related to the numerics. So if we develop a computer program, there's some algorithms involved. These algorithms, they need in most cases some parameters, uh, there may be also other parameters um, coming from the input file. So everything what is related to numerical issues, uh, we call precision, right? Whereas everything that is related to the method, we refer to accuracy. So for instance, in density functional theory, for instance, we distinguish between uh, different um, between different um, approximations that are known as the <coughs> sorry, exchange correlation functionals. So this is the approximations that we use in order to describe the quantum mechanical bit of the electron-electron interaction. Or there may be other mess, different methods, for instance, to describe excited states and so on and so forth. So everything that is related to different aspects of methodology is accuracy. So now looking at the encyclopedia, uh, this allows us to compare results from different sources. So you may compare a band structure that comes from one code with a band structure from another, or you may compare a band structure that comes from one exchange correlation functional with a band structure that comes from another functional. Uh, you may compare results that have been produced with different numerical precision. So we need to be very much aware of the fact that we should not mix apples or well, in German you say apples with spears, in English you say apples with oranges. So uh, that means we should be careful what we compare with each other, but on the other hand, we can use it in order to assess data quality. Because if you know that you have highly precise calculations there for different functionals, you can right, get right away the insight of the impact of the functional to the result is. So we can make use of it, but we need to be careful, right? And this, all this also relates to interoperability, of course. That's why I think interoperability is really, really a crucial thing. So, there may be a variety of questions arise, arising here, and some of them may even be answered by artificial intelligence. So for instance, how you can bring together data from different sources with different parameters, can we still find in some, some means for, uh, for comparing them with each other, for extrapolating one to the other? And you may get some, uh, in, some, some inf insight here by Daniel Schweckert's um, lecture, or there is also a preprint by Christian Carboni on, on error bars. Let me introduce you in this context to a very interesting study that has been launched by Stéphane Cotenier uh, from uh, in, in Belgium. And as you see from this paper with a lot of authors, it was a real huge community effort. So he brought together all code developers and people running calculations um, to, to do a, what it's now known as the Delta test. Uh, and this was uh, aiming at finding out how reproducible are calculations in density functional theory. So 
it's not only the different methods can give you different answers, but given a method, can different computer codes give, uh, give you the, uh, the, the same answer. Right? So, and of course, this has to do with data quality. How good are our, our codes? Yeah, so I said it was initiated by Stefan Cordenier together with his, at this time, student Kurt from our side of the school and since when Lubeck were involved in this. So what is it about? What is this famous delta? So we take um, or adopt a functional and all these calculations were carried out with the PBE implemented uh, functional um, and you take a code and with this code uh, you compute for a given material the energy versus the volume. So this looks like this. You have these data points, then you choose a second code and you do a similar calculation and then you see these two codes probably won't give you the same result. So you uh, introduce a quality factor that's called this delta, which uh, somehow um, evaluates the differences in total energies along the whole line. Mm -hmm. And that means such a delta factor is um, given for a pair of codes and for a given material. So now, what you can find if you go to the, um, the, the, the web page of Stefan Cotenier, you can find the, a tool you can play with. You choose one code, and in this case I've chosen exciting because we're developing this. And then uh, it will give you the delta factors uh, for all this code with respect to the one that you have chosen. Mm -hmm. So, and what you can see from here, and this is the average over, I think, 71 uh, materials. Um, then you can see that overall we get very, very good agreement. So this half million electron volt per atom uh, is a very tiny number. That means that in essence, all of these codes that you see here basically agree in what the results produce. So this is what you see. Uh, no, again, uh, summarized, this is an average over 71 elemental solids and 10 codes agree within half milli electron volt. So the first uh, conclusion from some people were, well, like uh, all is done, right? So lesson learned, everything is clear. We have now produced uh, codes and I have to say that these codes tremendously improved over the last year just because of this delta test. So they concluded everything is perfect now. So this is what the average tells you, right? But what we see here, and um, this is projected down to the periodic table of elements, what the difference is for different elements. So that means some of them, they're really perfect. So helium agree, uh, is the agreement between these two codes that I've chosen. This is exciting versus quantum espresso. 0.01, so this is even more than an order of magnitude lower than this, than this ratio. But this means that there must be other elements where the agreement is worse. For instance, chromium is 3.7, or oxygen, obviously, is a nasty element. So, well, what could be the reason for this? What could be the difference? One difference, obviously, could be that different codes employ different approximations. And quantum expresso is a pseudo potential code, exciting is an all electron uh, code. So there may be the argument that uh, pseudo potentials work less well for oxygen and chromium, or it's what's not the proper pseudo potential chosen, right? So let's compare with another code that is more similar to exciting. This is V2K. This is again an all electron code, even employing the same basis function. And then you see that the, the, the dark rate has disappeared, so the bigger discrepancies, the discrepancies are now much smaller. So obviously, similar methodology uh, gives similar results. Still, it's not quite the same. Here we have a discrepancy for nitrogen, for instance. Still, it's not big, but it's noticeable, right? And these are things we would like to, to learn. And um, we asked the next question, namely, what we see so far is total energy differences. And total energies are very forgiving quantities because uh, they are integrating out some 
some discrepancies, right? So you you get rid of of some uh, some problems when when you integrate out out things. So, and you were asking a question: What about if you look at different systems? So uh, there's no doubt that surfaces or defected systems or molecules will not behave the same as just the total energy of elemental solids. I mean, also elemental solids are really, really the, the, the simplest case you can imagine. And in terms of, uh, of um, uh, properties, band gaps or diffusion barriers or spectra definitely will not be spot on in these different codes. So we have to do a step further. And I show you a very small step which already shows you already the, the, the complications. And this is, um, I pick one element here, this is iron. And I don't even go to other quantities like barriers or spectra, I just use the total energies uh, and the quantities that are already inside this delta test. So let's have a look at this. What we show here, I mean, doing this uh, birch monaghan fit for the equation of state, and you get out the lattice parameter and you get the bulk modulus. And this is what is displayed here. Um, just for this element um, iron, and all the red dots are the results from this delta test. And the um, yellow uh, symbols are also results from the delta test. But in this case, I've highlighted the LAPW method. So this is the method that we have shown before, exciting and being to K are so-called linear augmented plane wave codes. So there is two striking things here, at least uh, let's say one is that also we think that we agree, uh, all codes agree on the result. If you look at the properties, there's a huge variety of, of results. So in lattice parameters, it's, I don't know, in the order of a percent or so. In bulk modulus, it's of the order of 20% and more, 20, 30%, right? So this is a discrepancy we cannot live with on the long run. Right? So this has nothing to do with school interoperability. Another thing that we learned from this is that one should not choose the calculation that fit best to experiment by claiming that this is the best one. Because, so here's the experimental results in uh, Turquoise. And the best calculation is the one where we see this already two green line cross. This is this point. So, and in fact, this is the calculation furthest away from experiment. So, what we conclude from this is that obviously the BBE functional is not good enough to describe these properties. Yeah, so, we need to, to do better here. Um, however, we, we learn already something here. So, um, so let's zoom in uh, because I think with this spread of results, we can certainly not distinguish between the numerical precision of the calculation because this is given by the spread and the accuracy of the functional because you see here already that um, the, the, the difference between two functionals right, is smaller than the, or maybe smaller or larger than the, the, the variance between the results from different, uh, from different codes. So let's zoom in, or no, we zoom out basically. So what we see here on this line, uh, the, the yellow signs, these are the results for different functionals. And again, this highlights this discrepancy even more. So the cloud of results from the Delta test, they span a range of five different functionals. So this is not the means of distinguishing between uh, numerical precision and the accuracy of the method. But with these calculations, this is the most precise calculation we can do with the yellow ones. We can indeed make sure that we can distinguish this. And once we do this, we can also um, employ it for looking at the impact of some, some effect, some particular effect or different methodology, if you like. So what we see here, again, somehow uh, projected on the um, periodic table of elements, the difference between calculations with and without spin orbit coupling. So the dark red means these are elements where spin orbit coupling is 
crucially important. In particular, you see here for polonium, um, the difference in this delta factors is 20. Before in the total energies, we had a difference of 0.5 between different codes. Now we have 20. That means for polonium, you never can trust uh, a comparison between calculations with and without spin orbit coupling. However, for calcium or strontium or barium, you can, because here the difference is really small. So here you can safely compare calculations from different methodology for those which are marked here, for instance, silver, um, mercury, you name it, we know the usual suspects. We need to make sure that we employ the right method in order to get the right answer. Here again, something uh, that is, is a direct outcome of this. So in the top curve, it was the delta factor, so the total energy. In the curve below, we show you the impact of spin orbit coupling on the volume. So what, what you see here in red, is um, elemental solids where the volume increases upon spin orbit coupling. In blue, you find the elements where the volume decreases, it shrinks. So polonium, for instance, the effect is not only in the energy, it's really in the, in the volume, it expands by 6%, whereas, for instance, mercury shrinks by nearly 8%. Okay, um, do you have questions? To this bit. No? Then we can continue. Um, this is a um, transparency that you know already, you have seen this um, explained by Matthias Scheffler last week. I would like to add a little bit here. So, first of all, what we have seen today, what I've shown today is all data from the third paradigm. We will just see in a few moments from now how we also like to integrate data from, uh, from the other particular from experiment. Um, and in order to do so, I like to introduce to you Max Planck. Of course, you all uh, work on the Max Planck, not all of you, but many of you work on the Max Planck graduate school. So we should listen to the opinion of Max Planck to all that what I told you today, right? So, he says, Max Planck being a theoretician, experiment is the only means of knowledge at our disposal. Everything else is poetry, imagination. So, I hope still that you believe me that theory can be useful. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to be, be a poet. But I think it's really time now also to look into experiment and see how we can uh, in, um, enhance our data collections with experimental data. And in order to do so, I would like to take a step back um, before I tell you where we are going uh, and tell you where we're coming from. So it's just a kind of a summary of uh, the, or how the uh, normal database has evolved. So, at the beginning, I pointed out already, the NOMAD repository was created um, out of a bilateral project between uh, Fritz Haber Institute and, 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 and Humboldt University on thermoelectric materials. We made it open to the public because we thought that other people uh, might be uh, also happy with getting more organized and to, to contribute the data for, um, for future reuse. Then um, the NOMAD laboratory um, came into, into place. So the repository was there before, but this was the European Union project, the Center of Excellence I mentioned at the beginning. Here you can see there were eight um, uh, scientific groups with different complementary expertise uh, were involved and also four um, HPC centers like Barcelona, Munich, Karking, and Helsinki, um, helped uh, helping us to set up the, the data infrastructure. And this was from 2015, 2019. And after this, um, we founded a nonprofit association. It's called 
Fair DI, Fair Data Infrastructure for Physics, Chemistry, Material Science and Astronomy. Uh, with the aim of building data infrastructure for the wider field. And as you see here from the left, um, the um, computational material science, in particular NOMAD, um, is only one pillar out of several. So experiments should come in, soft matter should come in, catalysis should come in. We even have astronomers on board with the, uh, with the aim of sharing expertise in these two phrases, uh, which are artificial intelligence and data infrastructure. So this is something that all of these pillars have in common. Yeah, and yeah, let's have a look a bit at, at experimental um, uh, sciences. Yeah, I mentioned before that NOMAD in the meantime is an implementation network of GoFair. We are also are present at the European uh, Open Science Cloud or whether you can, can find it there. Now, what are the next steps? Um, it's a project that we have applied for. So we are actually running for the German Research Data Initiative and FDI. And on the right, uh, you see uh, the plans that we have. Uh, on the left, you see it in a nutshell. So what we're aiming at is an all-inclusive user-driven approach to develop easy to use tools and an infrastructure towards fair data processing, storage, curation, sharing, and future use of materials data. Now, you may ask, what is it what I've been talking about for more than an hour now, or nearly one and a half? It's exactly something like this. But if you look at this scale here, then we just cover this tiny little bit. So basically, it's of initial calculations that I've shown you today. And we need to expand in terms of theory. We need to expand in terms of experiment. This is area B, also including area A, which is um, the synthesis, right? And also in involving the whole community by demonstrating that all these tools are really useful for one or the other research area. So let me uh, give you one example for experiments. Um, and that you can see already what the challenges are ahead of us. And I think it's the most simple example you could even think of uh, because it's a very simple material. It's an elemental solid. It's silver, so it's a noble material. You would argue that this is really a nice material to work with. Um, but then if you look at the optical spectra that we have displayed uh, underneath here, you see that the, all the curves that you find from different authors and different years hardly have anything in common. So look at the energy scale here. So these are electron volts. Huh? So there is nothing uh, that you would uh, like to find uh, like having two spectra spot on. So the difference is in peak positions, they are in the range of electron volts, up to electron volts. So how come? Obviously, there's a very big problem already arising from the sample because, well, some of the samples may, may be dirtier than others and dirt gives rise to you could even call it a different material, completely different uh, um, behavior of, of material. Also, some of the measurements have been done under UV condi uh, conditions, other not. So you get further contamination if you have a sample on the air. And many, many of these factors, the different instruments, the different resolution in instruments, in different energy ranges. So there's a lot of uh, things that uh, contribute to the veracity, right? And remember, we have this 4V of big data, volume, variety, veracity, and uh, velocity. I point out veracity here, but I also name variety because um, it's not only that um, you create different spectra from different samples, but you can also employ various techniques for getting the same property. So for instance, for getting the dielectric function that is plotting here, 
You can use ellipsometry, you can get absorption, reflectance spectroscopy, you can even employ electron uh, spectroscopy for this. So all of them give you the same property, none of them really directly. So ellipsometry may claim to give it directly, but still there's all this transformation um, interpretation tools behind. There's approximations behind when transforming one property to the other. So you have to keep in mind that um, this variety of mes methods also feed back to the veracity of the results. And needless to say, you can get the same quantity from theory on various different levels. You can use time dependent DFT, you can just use RPA, you can use uh, many body perturbation theory. So even there is veracity and variety coming in. So heads up, this gives you um, um, challenges for the, for the future. But again, like uh, I have claimed for the theoretical data, material science data are only meaningful uh, if you have an in-depth description and you know how they have been obtained. Yeah. So in this case, you start with the synthesis. You need to take into account how the sample is treated. Has the sample be kept on air? Has they be hammered, exposed to temperature, whatever? Um, capture the instrument and the entire measurement process. So was it a zero pressure, at zero temperature, at whatever? What what are the the, uh, the in instrumental? Uh, what is the instrument? What are the conditions? So if I just um, uh, give you an overview, you don't need to go into detail here, but this is in a nutshell all the metadata that you have to take to take into account in talking about experimental data, uh, starting with the samples or starting with instrument, how data are evaluated and further processed and, and transformed until they get published. And you see here, of course, also in theory, we had this complexity, but maybe experiment is even one order um, more complex than, um, than, than theory, because you have so many different, not only methods, you also have so many different instruments with different resolution and, and, and whatnot. That is really a challenge, but we are ready to go for this. Uh, we have already created a, a very enthusiastic team that will, uh, that will do this. So uh, finally, also in theory, not everything is, uh, is settled. Uh, so for instance, uh, what I've been talking about today was mainly data from density functional theory. For instance, if you like to go to excitation processes and I've taken out here the GW approach of many body perturbation theory, um, which is already, you see a complex process of how to compute what you want to compute finally the self energy. And there you see that in each and every step, you have to take decisions, what kind of algorithms to employ, what kind of approximation to employ. Um, and this also gives you a, a huge amount of, of uh, headaches in terms of data variety and veracity. Again, then adding with the complexity of having different implementations in different code. So this brings me to the end. This is the, the future outlook where we want to go. So I guess you, most of you may be sitting in this site here, either creating samples or measuring interesting properties or computing interesting properties. All of you may be creating data that may be locally stored, maybe bigger or smaller. But then the most interesting information, in particular the metadata, they should go to a central storage, which then in the best case would be part of the uh, overall NFTI. Uh, and out of this, the so-called portal, which is basically an extension of the encyclopedia, should be useful for the whole community. So that could be the public uh, the interested public, but of course could again be some of you. So for instance, uh, a person from synthesis looking at experimental data or a person from experiment looking at theoretical data. So you also, also have all these colors here. 
Um, so this is our, our vision to bring together data from all different sources to make it useful for the community and somehow also to link the tools from the encyclopedia and the artificial intelligence such that they have a needless, uh, a needless transformation between the tools such that the user can use one or the other uh, at the same time on the same footing. Yeah, and I think only with this, only fair data will enable that we can visualize the scientific vision. With this, I come back to the transparency that has been shown by Matthias Schaeffler at the beginning of last uh, week's um, uh, lecture. And I hope that I could show you somehow that fair data at some point will allow us to realize this vision. Um, with this, I thank you for attention and listening. And now we have more time for questions and answers. <laughs>